David Moskowitz, and we're here with the CEO of Ablinks, Dr. Edwin Moses. Dr. Moses, thanks for speaking with us today. The company's platform technology has given rise to over 25 candidates in the pipeline. Can you briefly explain how this novel technology is so productive? Absolutely. It's very interesting technology. You know that we all have immune systems that produce antibodies that protect us from viruses and bacterial infection. And the pharmaceutical industry has used those types of molecules very successfully over the last years to make multi-billion dollar products like Avastin and Herceptin. In the early 1990s in Belgium, it was discovered that there's a certain group of animals that produce antibodies, but much smaller ones, about one-tenth the size of classical antibodies. And this group of animals it comprises things like llamas and camels. And we make use of that technology and their immune systems to help us discover new drugs which are smaller, uh, more robust than classic antibodies. What other advantages do you have with your technology when drugs are developed using it? So size is important here, and one, being one-tenth the size of an antibody means that the molecules can penetrate tissues in a way that classical antibodies can't. These molecules are also unusually robust for proteins. So you can boil them, they'll denature, that means they unfold, and then they'll actually fold back together again. And that robustness allows us to deliver them to patients in routes not just through injection, but for example, through the pulmonary route, directly into the lung by inhalation, in creams, into the eye in many different ways that you can't do with a classical antibody. That's very interesting. Now, you've raised significant capital through partnerships with companies like Boehringer, uh, Novartis, and Merck Serono. Can you talk about some of the more exciting partnerships in the pipeline? Absolutely. We, we have two ways, really, of generating cash for our own research. One is through equity, right, selling our own shares, and we've sold about 200 million euros worth of that through private and public placings. And then you're right, we put a lot of emphasis in collaborations, both for validation of our technology and to help us generate cash. We generated 160 million euros from those collaborations that you've mentioned alone. Now in those three collaborators, we have some 18 programs ongoing. And the interesting thing about our technology is it's very widely applicable. So those uh, applications include things like hematology, inflammation, neurology. So we're not confined to one therapeutic area. There's some very interesting new technology being developed with those partners. And that was my question. Um, do you focus on specific therapeutic areas and are there compounds in, in the pipeline that are unpartnered at this point? So yes, there are six programs now in the clinic which are unpartnered that are wholly owned by ourselves that we've taken to either phase one or phase two. Our general principle is to take things through to phase two proof of concept and then partner then, except there's one particular case that we're working on at the moment, which is an orphan disease, so a very rare disease where there are only 10,000 patients affected per year. That program is also in phase two. It could go directly to registration after phase two. And in that case, we may be able to actually sell it and market it ourselves. So the majority of cases, we will partner in the clinic, and we have six of those available. But from time to time, we will take programs through ourselves. And in general, what is the overall strategy? Is it to partner compounds in the pipeline or to take them through to commercialization? So we have three main commercial strands at the moment. One is where we work with people like Novartis and Boehringer. Uh, we start right at the very, very beginning when they identify a target. They pay for everything, all the people working on the program, and they pay us milestones and royalties then based on success. We have another type of partnership which works with Merck Serona, for example, where we start again right at the beginning identifying a target and indication with them so we have a collaborator who's bought into our concept, and, but we share then the cost 50-50 all the way through. Merckstrona pays us a significant amount of money along the road there to allow us to reinvest that cash into the program. And then there's the third form where we, at our own uh, ideas, take programs through to a certain stage and partner them in the clinic. So there are three strands really to commercial strategy. Do you see yourselves ever developing a commercial organization? Yes, but I think we do. In the case of that orphan disease that I mentioned, that is the opportunity to develop a small at first commercial, uh, commercial organization with 20, 25 salespeople in Europe and the US. So that would be a place in which we could build. But we're not absolutely committed to being vertically integrated. We think it's more important to be successful. Uh, and so we always look to see whether a partner, whoever they may be, has more skills and competencies to take a product to market than we do. Sounds like a good strategy. Intellectual property is really a hallmark of platform technology companies. Tell us about the IP in your firm and how it protects the, the base. IP is, you're absolutely correct, 
are critical to us. We've invested a lot in that intellectual property. The company started by licensing the worldwide rights to healthcare applications of these smaller antibodies, which we call nanobodies, that arise from the camelid group of, fam uh, of animals. So there we have exclusive rights to those. Those rights end in the next few years, but we spent the next, the last 10 years building up over 500 patents and patent applications of many layers of protection of our technology. Not only are the patents important, but you can imagine in what we do, know-how is critical. For example, one of the things we have to do is immunize an animal with the antigen that we're looking to develop a product against. That immunization sounds quite straightforward, it's like a vaccination, but in fact has a lot of complex technology associated around it, which we don't patent, but we protect through confidentiality and know-how. Makes sense. And can you quickly comment on the balance sheet and what can investors expect with regard to cash burn this year? Balance sheet is something that we focused on very hard. So I mentioned that we'd raised 200 million in equity over the, the life of the company. We did a, an IPO in 2007. We raised 85 million euros. We raised a further 50 million in a secondary offering in 2010, which although is quite normal for US companies, is relatively unusual for European-based biotech companies. At this stage, at the end of the first quarter 2012, we had just over 85 million euros in cash. We actually had a cash positive first quarter. Um, and we're guiding the market that we're keeping cash burn at about 20 to 25 million this year. So it's a combination of spending around 50 to 60 million on research ourselves and generating around 40 million in income from our partnerships, from our milestones and from the upfront payments that we get in our collaborations. And in your view, what are the key events that are going to drive the stock this year that investors should be aware of? So I think they're commercial and they're clinical. So in the clinical sense, uh, we can expect in the next couple of months uh, important data from work that we did with our former partner Pfizer on anti-TNF-alpha, which is an important uh, product in inflammatory disease. Now, they showed proof of concept with that product last year. That product has come back to us into, uh, after a rationalization of their pipeline, so we now uh, wholly own it. But we are getting back now open label extension data, which is a 48-week follow-up of the original study, and we're expecting to publish that over the next month or two. So a very much more detailed set of data on both efficacy and safety, which I think is going to be very, very interesting. I think later in the year, in September, October time, we also expect data from another phase two program we have, again an inflammatory disease targeting interleukin-6 receptor. The phase one is complete in patients, the phase two recruitment is complete, and those potential POC data will be available then. And the third important area, I think, this year in clinical is that we're in phase one studies of our first pulmonary delivered product, which I mentioned earlier. This is treating a viral infection of the lung, RSV, for which there's no therapeutic available. And the reason is because antibodies can't be delivered directly into the lung. We can deliver the nanobodies through nebulization into the lung, and we're doing a safety study at the moment. And again, those data, I think, will come out in September or October. Other things commercially you should be looking for, I think, are expansions of existing programs with partners, which will just reinforce their uh, satisfaction and delight with the progress we've made so far. And I think you'll also see uh, in difficult target areas, such as iron channels, a very important class of molecules often involved in drugs developed for pain, which again have proved almost intractable for antibody uh, approaches. I think you'll see collaborations there with major partners who have looked around at the technology and decided that ours is the best way forward. So the $25 million or million euros, excuse me, of burn that you expect this year, does that include any cash flow coming in from current partnerships? It does. So what we do is we do a, a risk-adjusted assessment of the milestones and the various uh, payments that we might expect. We do not include in that assessment major licensing deals. So I talked to you about the TNF Alpha program, for example, in uh, phase two. We don't assume those because those are quite binary events and would distort our, our business plan. So we put into the business plan uh, risk-adjusted income that we can control and that we have some control over. Great. And one last question. You're listed on the Brussels exchange on Euronext. Are there any plans to list on a U.S. exchange? It's a question we ask U.S. investors every time we come here. It's key for us to understand. Most of the U.S. investors don't regard it as an impediment to investing in a company that we're listed over there because, of course, we are now part of the New York Stock Exchange as well uh, by being listed on, on Brussels. Um, but it's something that we will test constantly, and if we felt that it was important to U.S. investors in the future um, for us to be listed over here, it would be something we consider very carefully.